our world leaders have two responsibilities their responsibilities towards their own country and people and their responsibility as members of the united nations to the world as a whole their global responsibilities never has this been more true than in the fight against man made climate change we call on all leaders to recognize their responsibilities and redouble their efforts as those who find themselves in charge in this decade of global climate crisis the more countries pollute the greater their global responsibilities these are the key elements of the world's climate to-do list to achieve the global goals limit global heating to 1.5 degrees celsius to do this cut carbon pollution to get to a net zero world by 2050 invest in renewable energy no more coal no fossil fuel investment support and fund climate action in developing countries and stop the destruction of nature the world is making progress but nowhere near fast enough we see catastrophic events more and more multiplying everywhere and again not yet enough political will to fight it effectively and so we have a choice either we make a breakthrough either we change things and get together to change things or uh, we have a breakdown and the world will move in the wrong direction and all of us will face terrible problems and we can't wait it is code red for humanity the planet and its people are crying out for action businesses and finance the world over are making their own commitments though they must do much more we're fighting humanity's biggest crisis now is the time for countries and governments and leaders to act on their commitments for the sake of themselves and for the sake of the whole world it is their responsibility for this generation and for all the generations to come all the nations of the world must be united or all the nations of the world will suffer we must protect people and planet now and forever <laughs> uh, before happy valentine's day uh today i present this webinar uh the farm in action of 23 children and youth in commemoration of the dialogues with the dimiras movement today we we have the special webinar with the uh, brothers smith Zach, and zoe i want to read in this moment the biography of them uh, one moment, please. Uh, okay. Okay. Geography. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. Zoya and Zach Smith Life. Work and study of their family farm in New York, USA. Their farm called the Philosophy Family Farm. Is a 60 acre history organic permaculture Christmas tree farm surrounded with wilderness. So it works as a director of cultural ecology, researching indigenous culture of the area. The many facility will leave it of the farm of the past 163 years. And the bigger global system of the how farming and people connect. Sex service as a director of ecological research and design. He focused his work of regeneration soil, creating sustainable farming practice and creating a century of wildlife on their farm. We both love teaching and currently serve as air charter young leaders in North America. Wow, this is amazing biography of the Smith brothers, Zoe and Zach. Uh, Zoe and Zach, thank you so much for staying here in this special webinar. Welcome. In and your microphone is yours. 
Thank you so much, Rocio. We're so glad to be here. Yes, thank Welcome you. today. So, happy Valentine's Day. Yeah, happy Valentine's Day, everyone. So, yeah, so today uh, we will be uh, discussing with you um, about SDG 7, uh, Sustainable Development Goal 7, which is I'm gonna, affordable I'm gonna share a screen. Clean energy. Yeah, you can share a screen. And um, the focus for the webinar today is on how the Sustainable Development Goal uh, 7, uh, uh, Affordable and Clean Energy, applies to our farm here uh, in New York in the United States. So uh, we have a really good presentation prepared for you, and we're just getting our screen all set. There we go. Hopefully everyone can see. <laughs> Yeah, can you see our slides? I think so. I mean, it's just your screen sharing. There we go. Yeah. All right. Awesome. All right. So, hello, everyone. Um, we're so glad to be here and share about SPG7, Affordable and Clean Energy, and some of the historical energy systems on our farm, how energy has been used, um, and also our really cool and interesting and exciting plans to regenerate our farm into a sustainable energy system. Yeah. All right, yeah. I can get the slide. <laughs> so who we are. Hola. Hola, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Zoe. And my name it's is Zach. Funny. It's funny <laughs> picture yeah. of the season. Lisa and Bart. Oh, my God. Yes, I know. <laughs> we have lots, lots of funny of things. Congratulations on Valentine's Day, no? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so crazy. Funny yeah. moment. Oh my Definitely. God. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, continue, continue. Yeah, oh, thank you. <laughs> You'll be laughing. There's lots of funny things. Yes. Um, yeah, so I'm 20 years old. And I'm 18 years old. And we live with our family, our mom and dad, and a few cats and dogs <laughs> on our uh, historical permaculture farm located in upstate New York in America. And uh, the farm is from 1860. And um, we're trying to regenerate the farm uh, after it has been unsustainably farmed uh, through monocrops for many years. And uh, the most recent monocrop on the farm is, is Christmas trees. And um, we're trying to implement um, sustainable and regenerative, regenerative practices uh, to incorporate the trees and incorporate the history um, to create a thriving homestead for generations to come. Uh, we have been homeschooled uh, our entire education <laughs> life and um it's been a wonderful experience it has it's, it's taught us so much we've learned everything about philosophy environmental education um and we're taking that into what we call home college which we're mm -hmm. currently in right mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. uh where we live and learn from the farm and uh we we create this sustainable farm um that we can pass along to future generations mm -hmm. <laughs> so today we're having two storytellers in honor of um in honor of valentine's day <laughs> corey and cora corazon are sdg storytellers today <laughs> so zach is going to be corey and i'm going to be cora all right so i'm corey now as the heart so corey and i am saying let's learn about affordable and clean energy and hello i'm cora we're going to be the storytellers today explaining the history of energy on the farm and our really cool plans to implement green technology to regenerate our energy systems. So, are we ready? Let's go. Yay. All right, now on our farm. Now let's all get in a time machine, all right? And let's go all the way back to the 1700s, a long time ago. Now, if you can picture, this is long ago, this is the 1700s, and the land that our farm is currently on, it's the grounds of the Haudenosaunee indigenous people, or the Cuga Indians. And they uh, they have settlements to the north of where the farm is, but um, they use this land as their hunting grounds. It's beautiful wilderness, and they occasionally come down to visit um, and, and, and hunt, and it's just gorgeous, gorgeous woods and fields and nature. It's beautiful. Fast forward in our time machine to the year 1860, the year that the farm was founded, and there's a local family coming and they build a farm here. They establish a farm. They build a house. They build a barn. They bring some animals. And they really love and care about the land. Fast forward to uh, 1970. The farm has changed. Times have changed. And the farm is, is unfortunately falling into disrepair. People haven't lived here for a very long time. Times have changed. And the house is 
unfortunately, rather dilapidated. It's not in very good shape. It's falling down. The barn, the same. People haven't lived here for a very long time. But this new family comes. They try to modernize this house with new technology for the time, which is unfortunately not very sustainable. Things like electricity, oil heating, and that's kind of where we are today with these unsustainable systems. But we're trying to regenerate them, to bring all these systems, all that history from the indigenous, the 1860 timeframe, even the 1970s, into the present to regenerate this. <laughs> All right, to start off with, let's start off with the chimneys. Let's say we're standing in front of our big yellow farmhouse <laughs> right now, which we're actually in right now. Yeah. <laughs> we're looking up at this house, as we can see here in the picture. And all these chimneys, which you would think would be characteristic of an old house, they're actually not original, believe it or not. So this house wasn't heated by fireplaces way back in 1860. How was it heated? Well, we know a couple facts that might help us in this mystery that we're pondering right now. The farmers who lived here originally and built this house were, they had a little bit of wealth, uh, they had a little bit of money. And currently in the era of 1860, fireplaces were considered not very fashionable, but there was a system that was fashionable. Something called gravity heat. Now, what is gravity heat? You know, it's the most likely possibility of what was the central heating system in this house. Um, you know, gravity heat was a, it was a big, big furnace um, that was down in, in the basement of our, of our house, probably. And through big, long ducts and, uh, and heating systems, um, the heat would rise from this big furnace in, in the basement and rise up into the house and hopefully heat the house. And... I don't know. It was a it was kind of a trendy kind of hip new system, uh, you know, that probably was here in this house back in 1860. These furnaces were probably heated by coal, which is wow. That was a, that was a new trendy thing to use yeah. coal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Although it's very unsustainable, it was very trendy back in the day. Now let's imagine we're back in the farmhouse in 1860. We had this new coal fireplace furnace down in the basement that's heating the house through this gravity heat, coming out through all these ducts in the house and the floor. Um, in the past, you know, let's say we're some farm kids, right? Mm -hmm. Past, our dad would be chopping wood all day long to feed the fires, you know, because the fireplaces take lots and lots of wood. But now he doesn't have to chop wood anymore because coal is delivered for this mm -hmm. new furnace. Yeah. But unfortunately, our mom still has to work. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was always her job to clean out those wood-burning fireplaces. But sorry, mom, you still yeah. have to clean out the coal fireplaces. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, All right, there we go. Now, what did this furnace look like? Something like this octopus furnace. Doesn't it look kind of weird? Oh, ah! You're looking amazing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, there we go. Got my notes here. So this is something called an octopus furnace. This picture was probably from. Oh my God! Oh, yeah, it's, it's so weird looking, isn't it? <laughs> oh, this picture is probably from yeah, around the early 1900s. Funny um, moment, but, sorry, no, a surprise. Oh, surprise! Funny, isn't it? <laughs> I know it's funny looking. Yeah. Very nice one. Funny moment. So sorry. So yes, Zach. Okay. So we won't get to laugh out here. Yes, yes, yes. yes. If, if you start laughing, then then our job is done. That's good. That was our that's goal. Good. That's our goal. <laughs> okay, no problem. <laughs> Yeah, so these octopus furnaces, <laughs> they were these big, huge furnaces in the basement. They're kind of weird looking. They're a little scary. <laughs> They're called an octopus because they had all these arms, which were the vents going out to that gravity heat system that I was just talking about. Um, <laughs> now, octopus furnaces, as, as odd looking as they are, they're not very efficient. It was a simple, very simple, long living kind of furnace that existed around in the late 1800s and up until mm, about the mid 1900s. So they had a good hundred years to last in yeah, people's homes. Yeah. And some of them still exist, believe it or not. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> they, they waste a lot of energy. There's no fan to blow the hot air. It's simple gravity. Hot air rises, right, as we know. So that's why. 
the furnace was down in the basement and the hot air would rise to the levels of the house and hopefully keep the people warm. Um, unfortunately, octopus furnaces, as we know, are very unsustainable and <laughs> they would lose about 50% 50, 50 of hot air um, that would rise out of, the, out of a venting chimney and would go out outside of the house and not heat the house. Um, but the benefits of the octopus furnace were that they were very, very long living because they were. there were few moving parts. Mm -hmm. Not much could break. Now, where were these octopus furnaces? Like in the basement? Well, you could uh, often find one residing near a door. Now, a door would be where the coal would be delivered to fuel these furnaces. <laughs> now, let's pretend that we're getting a coal delivery on our farm, right? Where our mm -hmm. farm kids, let's say, you know, back in back in the 1860s, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And it's coal delivery day. Oh. Yay! <laughs> now there's lots of excitement in the house, right? Everyone's running around because the coal's coming to be delivered to heat our furnace. Now, up comes the driveway. There's a big, horse-drawn carriage loaded down with coal. Unsustainable. Unsustainable. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> but these men come to the door. We, uh, we open up the door in the basement near our furnace, and they start shoveling in mm. lots and lots of coal. All the kids, all of our siblings, because we have lots of siblings because it's the 1800s and mm -hmm. there's lots of farm lots kids. Of kids yeah. <laughs> and we start shoveling in the coal, our mom's helping us, our dad's helping us. And, you know, after about half an hour, all the shoveling is done. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully the workers are, are nice to us and they, they shovel in, in the door. They don't just leave it outside, outside the door because mm -hmm. our dad hates that, right? Mm -hmm. Our dad yeah. says, uh, our, the dad would say, well, you better help us out here. Because we're trying hard to bring in our coal, right? <laughs> and then when we're all done and the men leave, about half an hour has gone by. We have a big stack of coal in our basement that's hopefully away from the furnace so it doesn't catch on fire. That would be really bad. <laughs> and we have a coal supply to last us about half, half a winter. So we might need another delivery mm, come early spring, give or take. And then our mom gets out some nice shovels that are clean. And she shovels in some coal into the furnace, and we close it up, and our house is warm. All right, now here, it's a cool little animation. Now, where, where was this octopus furnace? Well, probably where our big, ugly oil tank is. <laughs> Unsustainable oil heat is what we currently have in our house. And we think this is where an octopus furnace was. <laughs> and... Unfortunately, the problem with oil heat is, is what we have in our house right now that was installed in the 70s. And um, we really do want to get rid of the system mm -hmm. because it's unsustainable. Oil heat is so expensive, um, but unfortunately it costs a lot of money to replace oil heat. But we do want to get mm -hmm. some money yeah, to uh, install geothermal. Mm -hmm. Now, let's imagine ourselves in 1972, right? Back when all these new systems are being implemented here on the farm. Oil heat is a new way to go. Americans are consuming lots and lots of oil. We're producing lots of oil here in this country. And then around 1972, maybe a little bit before, we start to import oil from other countries. And Americans love it. They, they keep buying, buying more and more oil. And then all of a sudden, it all comes to a halt because there's an embargo that's put on oil and there's an energy crisis. This lasted much of the decade. There's no more oil. What do we do? <laughs> there's pictures on the TV and magazines of long, long lines at gas stations. Cars can't get any gas. People don't have any oil to heat their homes. This is the end of the World War II, post-World War II era of growth. Maybe we need some new systems. I would say we do. <laughs> now, moving on to some of our current systems that like we have here in our farmhouse. We have typical things like a stove, a fridge, washing machine, and a dryer. And these are just some of the systems that we're thinking about how we want to regenerate. I mean, we need a stove, we need a fridge, we need a washer and dryer because we want our clothes to be nice and clean, right? <laughs> and so these are all um, these are all electric systems that can hopefully be converted to a more sustainable way um, when we use uh, solar maybe or wind yeah. power that we can eventually install 
<laughs> um, our stove is from 2001. Uh, you know, that it's old, you know, we're, we're hoping that um, we don't have to, to get rid of it, that we can, that we can keep it since it's, it's electric and it's not gas. Um, and we can, we can use solar energy to, uh, to make that sustainable. Um, our fridge is really old and we're not too sure when it's from. We tried mm -hmm. looking up the, uh, the serial number written on it. Uh, it could possibly be from 1982, 1992, 2002, or 2012. All those are pretty old. <laughs> and our washer and dryer are actually, we're very proud of those because they're high efficiency. It was actually, um, when we first bought the farm back in 2016, we replaced the old outdated washer and dryer that were there. And we put, uh, excuse me, we replaced them with these high efficiency washers and dryers. They only use about one gallon of water for the washing machine. And we're really proud of that because it's sustainable. It. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we replaced these systems already, the washer and dryer, is because they were affordable. It was it was easy for us to get an affordable and sustainable washer and dryer. And so that's why it's very important that these sustainable systems, these sustainable appliances become more affordable so that people can use them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, now moving on, there we go, <laughs> to our heating systems, our current heating systems. We don't have an octopus stove anymore, sorry, an octopus furnace, but we have a thermostat, which can controls our, unfortunately, oil-based baseboard hot water heating system. It's oil-powered, unfortunately, <laughs> and we're, we're hoping to replace this. But we have some, some yeah, really neat plans. Lots of good plans, yeah. <laughs> Um, the previous owner installed this, uh, this heating system, um, and he and his friends got together one afternoon and they, they installed all the electric systems. <laughs> and hopefully, um, that when, uh, when we eventually do replace some of these electrical systems, we take down the walls and, you know, replace the electrical systems, we can, uh, we can see if he did a good job on those electrical systems. <laughs> all right. Now. Let's go back to a random day in 1945, because we're focusing on this really cool thing called a Franklin stove that was in our farmhouse, in our kitchen, until the 1970s. It was a cooking stove and also a way to heat the house. Now, we're in 1945, right? You know, it's, you know, mid 1900s, you know, things are a little modern, but we also have a lot of the old systems of the past in the 1800s. It's a chilly fall day. You come inside, you're hungry. Now, what's for dinner? Hmm. You look, you, you think about what you're hungry for. How about some meatloaf and some potatoes? That sounds pretty good, you know? We'll fill you up and keep you warm. Now let's put those pots on the stove, all right? There we go, now they're bubbling on the stove, all right? <laughs> now, as we're waiting for our dinner to cook, let's talk about the Franklin stove, because this is a really, really cool, cool system of historical value here on the farm. <laughs> as you can see here in the picture on the, on the right, um, there's a, Kitty condo for our cats, a little cat playground. <laughs> and uh, that's where the Franklin stove used to be, something that looked just like in that picture. <laughs> now, the Franklin stove was invented by someone of great importance here in our country, Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> he was a renowned uh, person in our history. He was an inventor, a scientist, a printer. Um, he helped draft the Declaration of Independence for our country. Um, <laughs> and he also was known for making American homes a little bit warmer when he invented the Franklin stove back in 1742. <laughs> now the Franklin stove was different than a typical fireplace, an open hearth where there was just a fire burning without, without a cast iron stove. There were a series of, um, of metal plates and, and called baffles that would prevent the heat from escaping up the chimney and would funnel the heat into the house, keeping the room a little bit warmer than a typical fireplace. Cold air from the room would enter at the bottom. It would warm up in the fire and then it would exit through the top. <laughs> this would create the little bit of a warmer fireplace and it was much more efficient for the time. It was a big, big deal at the time and, and many people had them. Um, up, and, up until my dad, my dad had a Franklin stove in, in his childhood home. So they were very popular for a very long time. Oh, I think our dinner's ready. <laughs> Let's eat those potatoes and that meatloaf. <laughs> All right. 
This is fun. Yeah, it is. <laughs> All right, now moving on to our propane fireplace. Just a current system thing I'm actually looking at right now. We're, we're here in that living room, sitting on that couch. Mm -hmm, right there. <laughs> Look at that fireplace. Now, this propane fireplace, it uses propane. And although it's very cozy, uh, come winter evenings or we're playing guitar, you know, we're watching TV, um, but it, it runs on propane. And so this is a system that is outdated and it's unsustainable. Um, and uh, we're hoping to maybe replace it with some kind of newer, more uh, more sustainable um, uh, fireplace system, you know, that would, that would keep the cozy factor, but also be sustainable. Mm -hmm. Another form of our fireplaces <laughs> is our electric fireplace. It's in our dining room. And um, it's a beautiful, pretty addition to the dining room. And um, it's a, it's electric. So hopefully when we have solar and wind power here on the farm, uh, the solar will power this fireplace and it will be sustainable. Mm -hmm. Hooray. So, yes. <laughs> now, moving on to our favorite, the wood stove. Burns wood and it's in our family room. We actually installed this fireplace. It was not original. We we put it in ourselves, and um, it's by far the most uh, most efficient and uh, currently sustainable uh, practice for us um, to keep the house warm. It's it's the warmest fireplace. It's the prettiest, and it's the most fun because we get to build a fire and learn about making a fire. <laughs> like as we see here, I made that fire. <laughs> now. Um, this this method of a uh, wood burning stove uh, for us it's yeah it's the warmest and um, depending on uh, um, uh, for our, for ourselves from our farm so we don't have to uh, purchase uh, firewood um, we're planting a, a permaculture polyculture uh, where we we plant fast growing trees um, to harvest this firewood in a sustainable way um, and so that's one of our plans as uh, we consider how we make our house. Uh, sustainably heated. <laughs> Here's some of our wood that we stacked in our wood set here. <laughs> uh, we go through a lot of wood. And so, um, as you can picture, you know, uh, picture us stacking wood. Um, we have a big, huge pile of wood on our farm um, and we, we stack it into our truck. And then we drive the truck into our woodshed and then we load it up with lots and lots of wood uh, to heat that house. And uh, all the while thinking about what kind of polyculture do we want to build? You know, how do we grow fast growing trees um, to provide our own firewood? Um, and then how do we store it in a sustainable way? Um, because the wood needs about a year to, to season or dry out and be suitable for burning in a fireplace. So those are all things we're thinking about mm -hmm. as we're stacking our wood. <laughs> there. All right, what is this slide doing here? 1950s dresses. Hmm. What does that have to do with energy? Well, this brings us to another topic, fashion. Believe it or not, fashion and energy use, even in historical times, are all connected. Now, dresses in the 1950s were often sleeveless. That was part of the fashion of the day. Now, it wasn't just because it looked pretty and it was just a style. It also had to do with the, the general hubris of the time, the, the I can conquer nature, you know, um, kind of mentality, uh, the, because sleeveless dresses weren't just worn in the summertime, they were worn in the wintertime too, because people in that kind of post-World War II era had the feeling that they could conquer nature, that they could turn up their heat so high that they could wear a sleeveless dress even in the dead of winter, as we can see by all these fashionable dresses. They're pretty, but even in the wintertime, I think I'd rather wear a sweater. And this is for you, Rocio, because I know that you like those pretty dresses. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, thank you. <laughs> yeah, <it's a> <laughs> That's so great. <laughs> yeah, Zoe smirked in that one for you. She was like, oh, Rocio's going to love this. Yeah. Love this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now moving on to air conditioning. Now, I have to tell you, there isn't much to say about farmhouse air conditioning. <laughs> You're looking at it right here in the form of a porch. <laughs> Porches were essential in farmhouse living because, and, and still today too, because um, you're uh, in a farmhouse, you're you're working all day, you're hot, you just want to be cool. But there is no central air conditioning, so you go and sit outside on your porch. 
<laughs> it's a beautiful way to uh, get a cool breeze. It's fun. We we sit outside on our porches in the sun and mm -hmm. play some music. <laughs> um, and then sometimes we open up those big, huge farmhouse style windows that are low to the ground to let in cool breezes. There was actually a science back in the day that the low windows brought in a cooler breeze. <laughs> um, historical houses were often designed with uh, uh, in a way that, that a cross breeze could be achieved, where a front door would be opened and a back door would be opened, and then the breeze would flow through the house, <laughs> often through a living room or a dining room of sorts, and cool off the house in the process. <laughs> um, I'm really looking forward to installing uh, geothermal uh, heating and, and cooling in our house, um, but unfortunately we would have to install uh, air ducts um, in the ceiling. Uh, of our farmhouse because it's so old that there are no ducks that exist. Um, but I would I would really like some central air conditioning mm -hmm. eventually because I hate the summertime. I like cold, cold mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now let's look at some historical uh, indigenous practices of winter and summer houses because there's a difference. Some houses can be best used in the winter time and some houses in the summertime. Now, these houses are from the Chickasaw indigenous people that, are, uh, that lived in, um, in Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee in the southern United States. Our family took a trip uh, down the Natchez Trace Parkway that runs through the uh, original territory of the Chickasaw indigenous people. We wrote a book about it. It was a really, really fun experience, and we learned much about the Chickasaw indigenous people. <laughs> um, we learned, we stopped by a site of, uh, of a previous Chickasaw uh, village, and we learned about how they had a summer house and a winter house. Now, why would they do that? That's really interesting, and something maybe could be learned from that. <laughs> um, the summer houses were often tall uh, to let the hot air rise up and out of the house. There rarely were walls. Um, built in the summer house, except when it rained, when uh, temporary walls will be leaned up against the roof to present, prevent the, um, the house from being wet. And often the houses were built up off the ground to catch a breeze. The winter houses were often shaped like a spiral. If you picture a really cool shell that spirals around. They were round and they were often dug deep into the ground a little bit to keep... <laughs> My cat's meowing. <laughs> the houses were dug into the ground to make sure that they would stay warm. And the, uh, the houses were, were round, right? And uh, they, that would prevent the warm air from a fire inside from escaping and cold air from coming in. We actually stood there at the site of the summer house that was designed in a specific location to catch the cool breezes. And although the, house, the summer house was no longer there, we could feel the cool breeze hitting us. So they knew what they were talking mm -hmm. about, and there's mm -hmm. certainly something to be learned from this very interesting mm -hmm. design. Mm -hmm. All right, now, this is really cool. <laughs> there we go, yeah, you can get it. Oh, on our computer. Uh, we're just getting our computer to get to the next slide. Very, very quick. Oh, it just does give us one second, guys. We're getting our second. slide to, oh, I think it worked. Oh, no, it went too far. Actually, uh, no, no, you're right. There we go. I think it's on the right one. It's the right one. Okay. Good job. Okay. All right. Thank you, computer. <laughs> now, our story brings us to some historical food storing techniques because this is all part of how we use and consume energy. Now, let's talk about the ice box for a second. <laughs> ice boxes were the original form of refrigerators. Ice boxes were actually invented way back in the year of 1802. That's a long time ago. Wow, really? Long. Yeah, I didn't know that they were invented that long ago. But Thomas More, who invented this, this special kind of food storing technique, right? He was a cabinet maker and he was a farmer. And he was faced with a dilemma. He was trying to get some butter that he made on his farm to the market. But his butter always melted by the time it got there. Oh, no. <laughs> so how would he keep it cool? Well, he used his cabinet making techniques to his advantage. Mm -hmm. So he built a cabinet out of wood and he lined it with ice. And imagine that, it kept the butter cool by the time he got to market. Oh, wonderful. Well, I would want some of that butter. I that would too, really good. yeah. <laughs> now, Thomas More's icebox design lasted in various forms. People would improve upon it well until the 1930s when the modern day refrigerator became more popular and wealthier and middle-class homes. 
<laughs> the refrigerators would use electrical systems and something called Freon, which is a really, really bad, unsustainable practice. Mm -hmm. Bad, bad chemical. <laughs> and they, um, this would replace the ice and uh, use chemicals to keep the, the food cool in the refrigerator. Now, refrigerators are uh, one of the biggest pollutants in the world, one of the mm -hmm. biggest contributing problems to climate change. And although they're very convenient, maybe there's another way that we can go back to to being sustainable and keep our food cool. Maybe maybe an old icebox actually might be kind mm. of a cool way to do things. Cool I don't know. Yeah. yeah, and there's and there's alternatives too, but mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I kind of like the icebox. I do too. Yeah. Now, where would all that ice come from in our icebox? Hmm. Well, let's transport ourselves to a cold January day in, oh, let's say 1885, back when iceboxes were very important to people because there were no refrigerators. Now, let's go cut some ice from the lake as a community. That's mm -hmm. where all that ice came from, our local lake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as you can see here <laughs> on our slide, picture on the left, that was actually a picture taken in the 1800s from a lake just north of our farm. <laughs> so people would come together and they would cut ice. Now, let's let's say we're, we're cold, right? We're standing there on the lake. Yeah, brr. <laughs> <laughs> the community is all together. It's the ice cutting day. There's big, huge horses that can haul all this ice. They're stamping their hooves in the snow. There's lots of kids running around. All the families are there. These horses pulling these big, huge blades across the lake to score to cut the ice into big, huge chunks. And then big men come with huge saws to cut the blocks into smaller pieces. They load all these ice cubes, big, huge ice cubes, onto huge wooden sleighs being pulled by these big, huge horses. <laughs> lots of big ice big sleighs and big horses. <laughs> and all this ice is going to go into town and people are gonna take some of this ice for their homes. Let's say around midday, we stop for a snack because everyone's hungry, right? You know, cause it's cold. You know, we're gonna, we're eating some biscuits from our, from our pails, right? <laughs> you know, the, the uh, warm brick in the pails keeps those biscuits nice and warm. And then we're energized to cut some more ice. We load up the, these big sleighs full, full of ice. And then maybe we take a couple couple ice cubes for ourselves mm -hmm. we put it in our horse-drawn carriage and then around nightfall we we're all tired we're done we're very cold after mm -hmm. all that ice coming <laughs> and then we take our ice home and we put it in our ice box mm -hmm. and that will last us for a pretty mm -hmm. good amount of time mm -hmm. <laughs> now we know that our farm must have had an ice box because there's an ice pick actually downstairs mm -hmm. in the basement there it's is. still down there today mm -hmm. <laughs> we take it out and we put it back in <laughs> it's wedged in between uh stones in the foundation <laughs> um it's just a beautiful relic that i'm i'm very proud of from when there was currently uh there, there was probably um there was probably an ice box down in the basement and that's where that ice pick is there uh ice will be stored uh in the basement because it's nice and cool um so all the all the much better um cooler cooler weather to keep the keep the ice that much colder and the ice will be covered in sawdust wood chips uh, to prevent it from melting all throughout the winter um, and even into the summer months uh, mm -hmm. when the lake was no longer frozen so this is just a really cool piece of history because i know personally that the farm did indeed probably have an ice box mm -hmm. <laughs> all right now moving on to examples of food preservation because this is all important as we consider how do we create sustainable regenerative um, energy uses here on the farm. Well, let's look to some historical examples. Uh, our family took a, took a trip to a historical site, a uh, historical farm site uh, in Virginia, um, in America here. And um, on this historical farm site, they had a standing root cellar. Now, what is a root cellar? Hmm. Well, that was an old fashioned way of storing root vegetables in the cool, cool ground. Mm -hmm. uh, potatoes, carrots, um, onions, uh, different foods that uh, that needed to be kept cool in order to um, to last a longer period of time. Um, you know the this uh, we uh, uh, canned uh, sorry uh, vegetables would often be canned, uh, put in into a, a glass jar um, and sealed, and then kept in this fruit cellar uh, to last even longer mm -hmm. too. And we ourselves are implementing um, some canning techniques as we, we grow uh, some of our vegetables mm -hmm. here on our farm, like mm -hmm. tomatoes and uh, cucumbers, mm -hmm. and we can them in a glass jar, and then we're storing them down in our basement. And we hope to build a root cellar someday mm -hmm. because we have lots of hills 
um, and root cellars were often built on the side of a hill. Mm -hmm. And um, that would be a really neat yeah. way to uh, sustainably store some of our vegetables that we, yeah. we can here on the farm. And also while we're learning the process yeah. of canning, we're learning a lot of the self-sufficiency there yeah, too, definitely. right? Which is a Absolutely. great part of sustainability. So I'd say sign us up for that, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Also on this historical farm site, they had a spring house. Now, spring house is where they would store all of their dairy products, things like milk, butter, eggs. Mm, sounds good, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> and uh, they would build this structure, this wooden structure, over top of a running stream, which is a safe place to keep all those dairy products out of the elements. But they would put all those dairy products into the cool water directly. Cold, clear water that would keep all those dairy products mm -hmm. nice and cold. This is a historical way of keeping dairy products for a longer time. <laughs> and this farm had a spring house, indeed. I would love to build a spring I house would, at some point yeah, in time. Very interesting. And um, it was interesting. We learned a little piece of history when we were there. The stream, as we could see in the floor, it wasn't running as high as uh, in previous decades back when the farm was established. Um, dams on rivers had prevented the water flow from being as high as it normally was. So unfortunately, it doesn't seem like the spring house mm -hmm. would be very effective nowadays. It wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> also, um, another historical farm we visited called Bringaker Cabin in North Carolina in America um, had a spring house. Spring houses were very common on farms because all farms needed to keep their dairy, their eggs, their milk, their butter, some way or another. <laughs> now, the Bringakers, the family who established this farm, their spring house, they always said that their spring water was two degrees colder than the morning. Now, I think that's a beautiful mm, poetic way to describe the beauty of a spring house where jars of milk, you know, containers of eggs, boxes of butter will be placed into the water to keep them cool and stay for a longer mm -hmm. period of time. Yeah. Wow, that sounds really cool and really sustainable. It does. I love that. Yeah. There you go. We actually try to create our own version of a spring house where on our farm we have a pretty good amount of snow. Fortunately, not I snow. Know, Cool yeah, is that cat cute? <laughs> that, that's not my cat. That's actually a meme I found. It's a meme, I see, but I see in this moment my cat's first no. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Look at that expression on the cat's face. So, so comical. That is so yeah. Funny. It makes me laugh okay. every time. Okay, continue. <laughs> yeah. I think I think that was late at night when I was putting that cat meme in there. I was cracking up. I was laughing so much. <laughs> now an example of of how we try to sustainably store uh, the produce and food on our farm. Now we have lots of maple trees on mm -hmm. our farm and we tap them for their sap. Uh, it's a scientific technique where you drill a little hole, uh, not too far, there's a, there's a special method to mm -hmm. not hurt the tree, into, into the tree bark to um, around springtime, like early spring, around like the, the first week of March, give or take, in our region. And uh, that's the time where the sap is rising from the roots of the tree and going out into the branches to start the new spring season and create new leaves. And this is the time when humans have figured out that we can tap the tree and get a hold of a little bit of that tasty, sweet, very sugary maple sap um, that we then boil down into really delicious maple syrup, mm -hmm. which we eat on top of pancakes and waffles. I think I actually had some this morning. Yeah, I, I did too. Yeah, yeah. That, was <laughs> that was very was good. Really good. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so what we try to do is um, the, the trees produce a lot of sap and we can't store it all in our refrigerator. Well, oh no, we have to be more sustainable. So we store all those jugs of maple sap in the snow. Mm -hmm. And it works yeah. just as much mm -hmm. as a refrigerator without the unsustainable part. Mm -hmm. So those are some examples of, of how we try to be more sustainable here on the farm. <laughs> here's a here's a close-up picture here on the right of, um, of a drip of sap falling into our bucket. That's actually a picture I took. I'm really proud of it. It's very pretty. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we tap our trees um, to, uh, to uh, create really tasty syrup and also mm -hmm. um, we're, we're trying to figure out how we can store the sap in, yeah, in a sustainable mm -hmm. way uh, in the snow. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really fun to, to tap uh, maple trees. We, uh, we get a, a big fire going, and uh, as it's cold outside, you can picture us shiver next to the big pot the of syrup. Big, big puppy coats on the yeah, warm yeah. Yeah. We stir the sap around and around to keep it boiling, um, and then we, uh, we boil it down into, into maple syrup, and, uh, and then hopefully mm -hmm. store it in the snow. <laughs> Is it working? 
it should it, there, there we go. It okay. Yep. Now, lastly, one more thing that we need to retrofit to make more sustainable is our tractors here on the farm. We have two. Our big red one is named Marianne, <laughs> and our small green one is named Buckwheat. And our tractors are very important to us. We need them on the farm. We need them to uh, cut trails, um, to haul wood. Uh, as you can see in the picture, Zach is stacking a big pile of wood there with Marianne. And they're very important to us uh, as we create habitat and just general maintenance of the farm. Um, but they're gas and diesel powered. And so maybe it might be better uh, someday to uh, make them more sustainable with hopefully like wind power or uh, or maybe mm. even an electric engine, something with a lot of energy, because uh, tractors uh, need a lot of torque or a lot of uh, a lot of uh, power mm -hmm. in order to get through tough terrain <laughs> and do their do their tractor thing. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't use our tractors very often at all. Um, we don't we don't plow our fields. We don't we don't cut all uh, much land, uh, and so we don't use our tractors that often, which is a good way to um, to you know. To be sustainable, and uh, we have many trees which which can hopefully uh, yeah. offset some of those um, uh, some of the uh, carbon. Good. All right. Wow. Now that was a lot of talking. Yeah, that was amazing, Zoe. Yeah. Good job. Thank yeah. You. That was cool. Now, Zach, do you want to take a turn? Here? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Zoe. That was a really informative and cool oh, presentation you did there. I know we have more, but that was just a really great intro, and I love that. Yeah. So um. So, hi everyone, remember I'm Zach, <laughs> Zoe, and um, I'm going to talk about um, renewable energy um, and kind of the modern day perspective of the things we've learned so far. Uh, um, so, yeah, I'm going to kind of focus on how in the modern day we can turn to renewable energy sources um, to create a sustainable future. And, uh, and just, I'm just going to emphasize just how important it is uh, so we recognize how we all can have a contributing factor to sustainability and we all can have a role in creating a sustainable future um, because renewable energy, it's, it's all around us and uh, we can turn to it at any point in our lives. There's, it's never too late to start becoming sustainable and regenerative. So, yeah, and uh, after I talk about some renewable energies, I'm going to discuss how our farm, the Philosophy Family Farm, is, uh, is implementing these uh, renewable energy practices and um, all, all of our plans for the future uh, starting this year, because this year is going to be a big year for us for implementing these strategies, which I'm really excited about, right? Um, and I'm going to um, give you guys some insights on how you guys can also do the same thing uh, on your property, in your community, um, in your countries. And um, yeah, let's just start from there. So um, the first renewable energy I'm going to focus on is geothermal energy. Um, and I just want to start by emphasizing how important geothermal energy is because geothermal energy is energy that comes from the earth. It's all around us. It's not something that needs to be created or built in some way or tweaked in some way. It's just energy that comes from the earth right underneath our feet. So wherever we step, there's always that energy right beneath us. It's always waiting. It's a great potential. Um, and so geothermal energy is interesting because it, it's very multifaceted. There's many different uses for it. Um, one of the things that geothermal energy can do is it can produce electricity, um, but it also can provide temperature regulation. It can, it can provide heating for a house, a building, or, or it can provide cooling uh, during warmer months. So, and there's different, definitely different methods in order for that to come about. So, um, I'll just briefly explain what geothermal energy is. It's a very kind of complicated scientific thing, but it's, it's kind of fun when you go into the details sometimes. So I'll explain it briefly. So geothermal energy, it's, it's kind of like, a, it's a thermal energy and it's originally stored in the crust of the earth. So really far beneath us. Um, and it's actually caused by a combination of the formation of the planet, like, you know, millions, millions of years ago, and also the uh, radioactive decay of materials. Um, that causes that heat and that friction. So this heat actually causes the mantle of the Earth to move, and that's called convection. And um, this moves the tectonic plates of the Earth. The tectonic plates are just basically parts of the Earth's crust, the Earth parts of the Earth's crust that are kind of separated at different points uh, on the planet. And this process, this convection, the mantle moving up caused by the heat, uh, it brings magma, which is just melted rock, uh, closer to the surface of the Earth. 
Um, in this process heats rocks and aquifers, which are just um, collections of water uh, underneath the ground. And this heating process brings lots of hot water to the surface of the earth in these spots. And that's kind of where lots of geothermal energy can come from. It can come from uh, water underneath the ground or just general heat caused by the movement of the earth and this process of the mantle bringing the magma up and heating the earth beneath us, which is, I think is a really cool process, just to give us insight into where this comes from. Um, and of course, it's not this energy, it's not all the surface, it's, uh, it's really, it's, it's far beneath us too. There's different stages of where the heat approaches the surface of the earth and um, at what time. So that's why I love geothermal energy is that you can get it from different depths in the soil and it's always there no matter what. So that's why I really love about it. Okay, um, so the ground source heat pump is, a, is what I'm gonna start with. This is one of the most common uh, techniques of uh, using geothermal energy. So basically a ground source heat pump is a temperature like, regulation system um, that uses uh, the constant temperature of the ground as a way to kind of steady indoor temperatures um, rather than using outside air to do that. Because outside air, as you know, is a lot more, um, it fluctuates a lot more, it's a lot more inconsistent um, than indoor uh, or, or um, underground um, air, air underground, because it's a lot more stable. So um, it's obviously, it's common for temperatures just below the surface of the ground to be maybe between um, seven degrees Celsius to 21 degrees Celsius or 45 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit in our country. Um, so when the outside air is warm, then the earth, the air in the earth is always a lot cooler than the air um, outside. And when the outside air is cold, guess what? The earth is warmer than that outside air. So I see that the earth is being a great way of um, kind of balancing the more extreme temperatures of uh, outside air because it's just, it's underground, it's a lot more stable. So ground source heat pumps, they comprise systems where they're generally groups of pipes that are filled with some kind of medium. It's either a water or maybe some kind of antifreeze. And uh, they travel underground. Um, a, a trench is dug and they're placed underground. Um, and these pipes, they generally receive the, temp the temperature underground. And then they're brought inside the building through uh, an actual physical heat pump, a structure, right, just uh, outside the house. And this can alter the, the refrigerant, uh, this mixture inside uh, the pipe system um, to be more vaporized. Uh, and then this vapor is brought to a device called a heat exchanger. And this transfers the, the temperature of the refrigerant inside the pipes to the air inside the house. So that's kind of the general process of the ground source heat pump and how it, it, it transfers the, uh, the temperature of the ground inside the house. Um, so there's also a, what's called a closed loop geothermal system and an open loop geothermal system. So the closed loop system is basically has one set of pipes um, and they're connected um, with, they're all connected together. There's, there's no like output for them. It's all just one system. They're all interconnected. Um, and the refrigerant inside the closed loop pipes, they only need to be supplied once. Um, and that's, that's how that system works. That's probably the most common type of system because the refrigerant is only filled in once and then it's very easy from that point onwards. And, and homeowners really like that. Um, so the open loop system though is a little less common, but still equally interesting. So the open loop system has a, a process where uh, there's an aquifer, as I mentioned before, kind of like a collection of pool of water. Um, and this open loop system it has pipes kind of the funnel into this aquifer and also funnel out of the aquifer. So the pipes are not ultimately linked in the end. There's kind of like a, a, a pipe that goes into the house, and the pipe that comes out of the house. They both end up in this aquifer. And the aquifer, since it's underground, is, is pretty much generally the same temperature as any other space within the ground. Um, it's very balanced. It's a, uh, so obviously a much more mild temperature in the outside air. So it also equally works just like a closed loop system. Um, and the, another reason why the closed loop system is more common than the open loop system is because 
Uh, an open loop system requires very clean water in order to work. And of course, not everyone has um, the access to very clean water for that process to work. So closed loop systems are great because you just have, you just have a refrigerant inside the pipes and you fill it up once and that's all you need for you to have a great heating and cooling system in your house. I know, isn't that very neat? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so you might be wondering at this point, okay, this sounds all interesting, but how does it actually heat the house and how does it cool the house? Well, I'll tell you. So for the heating process, the ground source heat pump sends this refrigerant fluid medium down the pipe system and um, say it's cold outside. So it receives the obviously warmer temperature of the ground, this refrigerant, and then it's sent to the heat pump after it comes up from the ground. And the heat pump is also filled with its own liquid refrigerant. It's separate from that in the pipes. And in this process, um, it's kind of like exchange of the heat in the refrigerant in the pipes that therefore gives the heat to the refrigerant in the, um, in the heat pump, in the heat pump structure. So this process of the heat exchange makes the vapor inside um, of the heat pump, uh, sorry, the, the, the refrigerant in the heat pump turn to vapor. And so um, and it becomes very compressed, which also increases its temperature, which therefore moves and sends the vapor um, into this process where it connects with the air inside the home. So since it's become vaporized, it's just general heat that meets the air and that's how it heats the home. And then what happens afterwards, you might think, okay, so that's one, that's one routine, but how does it continue? Well, all that happens after that is the refrigerant, which is still in the pipe system, uh, it is decompressed. So it, it goes from a vaporized state back to a liquid state and it cools down. And it's sent back down the pipe system to restart the process. So you can see how the refrigerant, it's not just a system where it's like, you know, it, it's, it's either hot or it's cold. It's extremely reactive to an, a change in environment, which is why it can go from hot to cold very quickly. So, and for the cooling process, it's just the same thing in reverse. Um, what happens is the refrigerant in the heat pump, um, it's, it, get, it becomes very hot, it becomes very pressurized from the compressor. And once it moves to the condenser, it is liquidized, but it's still hot. And so it transfers that heat to the refrigerant in the pipe system that goes underground. And so that liquid, that refrigerant, goes underground, it releases that heat to the ground. And remember, so this is like, say, when it's hot outside. So it releases that heat that's inside the home to the ground. And it moves through this thing called an expansion valve that's part of the heat pump. And this starts to decrease both the temperature and the pressure of the refrigerant. So it becomes cold suddenly. Can you imagine that just being like hot and then being cold? <laughs> and it moves through this thing called an, an evaporator coil. Um, and it's just a way of releasing that air into the building. So at this point, the air is cold. So it's like air conditioning. It becomes cold and it's released into the building and it, it can cool the air. So any hot air that's in the building is absorbed by this refrigerant. So if there's only cold air left and you feel nice and, and cooled down inside the home. and as you can imagine, how does it restart? The refrigerant goes back to the compressor and it restarts the process of being heated up and then going down to the system, cooling off and coming back through the evaporator coil to release into the, into the building. So I just find that very fascinating, very interesting. Cool. Yeah. Um, a side note, gra uh, ground source heat pumps also can heat water in your home. So if you want hot water, um, you can store water in a cylinder. Um, if you use the ground the ground source heat pump system, it can directly connect to the cylinder and uh, a heat exchanger can heat the water for you. So that's another great thing that it can do. And um, I find ground source heat pumps super effective. They're uh, good for, for residen residential uh, homeowners. Um, they're low cost. They can be done anywhere. And um, you, it can, in a sense that there's no um, thermal activity underneath the ground you need. You don't need to be in the area with a lot of say hot springs or volcanoes, you know, it can be done anywhere in um, a very flat area. It can be done anywhere, which is why I love it so much. So, yeah, so that's why I appreciate these. And you're probably wondering, well, what's next? Well, I'll show you. <laughs> All right, so another kind of geothermal use is, uh, it's called direct use geothermal. 
So um, I like to think that this is very similar to um, the open loop ground source heat pump system I was talking about, where the pipes go into a body of water, an aquifer underground. But the difference between the open loop ground source heat pump system and this direct use geothermal practice is that uh, the direct use has very hot water already at the surface of the soil where people can extract the water and use it for various purposes. Um, think of your hot springs. You can see here in the top right of the picture, it's a very, very beautiful hot spring in Yellowstone National Park, which is a, a famed national park here in, um, in Wyoming, a state in the United States. Um, it's a hot spring. It's extremely hot water. It's been heated by um, you know, thermal activity and magma, heating rocks underneath it to create that steam that comes out. Um, so it's very beautiful. I think our mom visited, her, visited uh, Morning Glory once and she loved it. It was beautiful. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so with this direct use practice, um, the water is, it actually comes from the rocks right underneath the, right underneath the ground. Um, and this creates the, the heat and the steam that you see because this ground has already been heated and the water has that effect where it's all vaporized. It's just, it's extremely hot. Um, and in order for people to use like this kind of system, what they can do is they can drill a well into this space. Um, they can have a pipe system, it can be pumped into a house. Um, and oftentimes, as you can imagine, you know, heat rises. So hot water and steam from these, um, from these aquifers, they can just travel up on their own. Does, a lot of the times they don't even need to be pumped because they're just already so hot. So I find that to be very interesting. Um, and also, uh, as you can imagine, uh, water can be used directly from these sources. Um, I like to think about um, these beautiful monkeys in Japan called Japanese macaques, and they're, um, they're, they use hot springs um, where it's, it's already geothermally heated. And so in the wintertime when it's extremely snowy, they're in a very mountainous region. And what they do is they, they bathe in the hot water and they, yeah, they keep warm through that. So, and obviously humans have also been doing that for ages by using, um, you know, if you've heard of like mineral springs and things like that, people bathe in warm water that's been heated geothermally. So, so I, I just find that to be very interesting. And um, yeah, let's move on to the next one. Cool. All right, so the next one is called yeah, deep and enhanced geothermal systems. So yeah, so deep and enhanced geothermal systems, it's kind of a, a way of describing the process of extracting um, hot water from great depths in the soil. So like far from beneath us, not at the surface and not a few feet below the surface, but very far down, sometimes as far as a mile. Um, and so in these systems, um, it can be water that's being extracted or just steam that's being extracted um, for various purposes up at the surface. And um, a lot of them are mechanical, as I'll show you in a second. A lot of them have to do with creating electricity. So yeah, so the most common and the most um, widespread form of a deep and enhanced geothermal system is a geothermal power plant. And geothermal power plants, they've gotten extremely popular over the past few decades, especially in countries with lots of thermal activity. Um, so yes, they're found in areas where the hot water is really close to the surface based on the tectonic movements I was talking about. And um, geothermal power plants are unique because unlike what I was talking about previously with um, heating and cooling systems, how the geothermal power plants, they actually produce electricity, which is very helpful because, you know, we all, we all, let's just face it, we all need electricity, we all need lights, it just really helps us. Um, so the process of geothermal power plants is, is very interesting because of how, how you need to go very deep into the ground and it also has to do with just how many components comprise a system. So, Usually in a, in a standard geothermal power plant, this applies to all different kinds of power plants. Um, there are two wells that are drilled uh, for this process. There's what's called a production well, and that's where, that's where the beginning of the process is. And that's also what's called the injection well. You can see in the image there, the production well is, is labeled here one, you know, it doesn't say, so that's the production well, this is the production well. Uh, and over here at, at number five, that's the injection well. And that's where the process ends. So the production well is drilled typically in a geothermal reservoir. And the hot liquids that come up from the reservoir are taken to the power plant up at the surface in the ground level. 
and the steam is taken from the hot water turns turbine blades, turbine blades on a shaft. And this creates an electrical current, which therefore powers a generator, which then takes the electricity to a transformer. And this increases the voltage, which then takes the electricity to us, cities and communities where people can use this electricity. Is that interesting? So yeah, and briefly I'll explain the three different types of power plants because I find this to be very fascinating. There's what's called a flash steam power plant. And this is the most common kind of power plant. Uh, it was first actually built in 1958 and first operated in the country of New Zealand. So in this case, um, waters with temperatures of say 180, 182 Celsius or more, uh, they flow naturally upward with high pressure up towards the surface, the ground level. And they eventually turn to a vapor and the steam is uh, from this vapor is separated from the water and this powers the turbine blades. And the leftover water and condensed steam then is injected back into the reservoir to restart the process again. And yeah, this is very common practice because of the amount of um, uh, reservoirs, water reservoirs underneath the, the surface um, in countries with lots of this kind of thermal activity underneath the ground. So um, the, another kind is called the dry steam power plant. This is actually the oldest kind of power plant in the world. It's the least common, but it's the oldest, which I found to be very great because it has a lot of historical factors included with it. Um, it actually first was built in 1904 in Italy. And uh, in this process, the, the dry steam power plant, um, it connects to underground resources of like steam and vapor, but not water, which is interesting. This is why this kind of practice is the least common is because so many of these aquifers far beneath us are they're, they're purely water rather than just steam produced from a uh, heated rock. So this is why this process is not quite as common, but equally interesting. Um, so this obviously powers the same process of the turbine movement. And um, it also, you know, is increases the voltage in the same way to send to the communities, just like the, uh, the flash steam power plant. Um, they actually, the United States um, has the, uh, the world's largest geothermal power plant. And it happens to be a dry steam power plant. Um, it's called uh, the geysers. And it's actually not even considered a power plant. It's called a geothermal field because there are actually 18 different power plants just in this one area. I know that's a lot. So that's why it's called a field. And it, and it actually is a dry steam power plant. So although it's not the most common kind of power plant, you can see how when the right resource, when the right resources are found, this kind of great things can happen. So, um, and the last kind of geothermal power plant is called the binary cycle power plant. And it's called binary because it involves uh, two different liquids being heated rather than just one. So in this case, the water that's coming to the surface is actually, does not need to be super hot. It can actually be as low as only 57 degrees Celsius or 135 degrees Fahrenheit when it comes to the surface. Um, and this hot water, hot but not super hot water, heats a secondary fluid, which is usually like an organic compound of some sort, um, which has a very low boiling point. And so in it, this process, again, it, it has a heat exchanger, just like um, the ground source heat pump. So this uh, hot but not super hot water exchanges heat with this organic compound, which then therefore, as you could guess, turns into a vapor, turns to turbines, and starts the process again to send electricity to cities and communities. So uh, the binary cycle is kind of in the middle. It's kind of like the second most popular, but it's getting even more popular and could be expected to even surpass the flash steam power plants because of how it can operate in areas that don't have super hot water because finding extremely hot water only a mile beneath the surface of the ground, it's not found everywhere. It's only found in areas with you know, lots of tectonic activity. But in the binary cycle, it can happen in areas that are farther away from these spaces with um, more moderate water temperatures with the help of the, uh, the, um, of the organic compound fluid, which therefore can turn into a vapor. So it's, see, we, we, all, we all can help each other out. So. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, that's, that's kind of how geothermal power plants work. And um, now you're probably wondering, so what do they look like? Well, here's some really cool pictures in the next slide. So, yeah, so here are some different geothermal power plants in different parts of the world. Um, you can see how they can be in open areas. Uh, they can be in more mountainous regions with uh, less wide open space. Um, 
you can see in the top left, that's called, I'm pronouncing it right, Headless Hathi power plant in Iceland. Um, it's the eighth largest power plant in the world, and it's the very largest in Iceland. And it's called, a, it's a flash steam power plant, and it produces uh, 303 megawatts of electricity, which is pretty impressive. Uh, in the top right, that's called the Makban power plant in the Philippines. It's also a flash steam power plant, and it produces 458 megawatts of electricity, so even more than the one in Iceland. And uh, in the bottom left corner, you can see the uh, Lardarello power plant. It's actually the oldest in the world, and it's actually a dry steam power plant. And it's the one that was built in 1904. And believe it or not, it actually was built, uh, or invented at least, by an Italian prince who was, experiment who was experimenting with this acid called boric acid. And he first uh, found resources for geothermal activity, and he created a geothermal electric generator around 1904, which then led to the creation of the first geothermal power plant. And this power plant produces 800 megawatts of electricity, which helped um, the country of Italy become the sixth largest producer of geothermal energy in the world just a couple of years ago. So you can see how this influence can really spread really quickly. On this slide, I'm just showing how it's common for um, areas with lots of tectonic activity to have water at the surface. And when there's uh, this very hot, very heated water at the surface, it leads to the development of power plants, like in Iceland here at the top, and also in California down here at the bottom. And right here, this is the geysers complex I was talking about earlier, the geysers field, as I should say. And um, that's the complex of 18 different power plants. So it's just a lot of cultural pride there. It's just cool to see that it's in California and that it's also in different parts of the world. Um, yeah, so on this slide, this is just kind of a map of different areas around the world with lots of geothermal activity. Um, you can see in the map that they're often kind of along coastlines. Um, oh, yes, as I emphasized that the darker red means more geothermal activity um, and more suitability for ge geothermal energy. Um, they're often along coastlines or in islands where, because te tectonic plates often are along oceans, so islands often have a lot of geothermal activity because of them being along kind of the kind of like the edge of those tectonic plates, which leads to a lot of geothermal activity too. And it's good to know in your country where do your geothermal energy is being produced, if if there is, if there isn't, where is there kind of the most tectonic activity? Where is there more potential for say power plants like the binary cycle power plants that don't need as uh as extremely heated water in order in order to operate? Think about where they are and um and kind of what kind of things you can do to find out more about your country to spread the word on how important geothermal power plants are. All right, and this slide, uh, I'm going to move away from the Earth and talk more about the sun with solar technology. Um, so obviously, as you know by now, uh, solar, solar fields, solar panels, um, they're being supported because uh, they can be in areas with wide open space, um, where there definitely is a lot of, at least in our country. Um, and companies, got the, a lot of the times different governments, are taking advantage of this opportunity to um, create solar fields in areas with these wide open spaces because the, the countries, countries need this kind of technology. And a lot of times it's very imperative to just, for this to happen. But um, some, of, some of the things that can come out of these processes can be very negative when the land um, that uh, the solar panels use in these fields um, take away some of the land that wildlife uses. And so a lot of the times um, this land, it can't really be hospitable for animals because they get used to a certain kind of environment, especially animals used to wide open spaces and um, animals which have very unique um, adaptation strategies to be able to survive in these kinds of conditions. Um, it can be very difficult for them to adapt and adjust to solar panels, solar, huge solar fields being installed in areas where they have made their homes. And one example I can think of that really um, was an eye opener for me, which and also was a little bit sad, is the uh, Gemini solar project in the state of Nevada in here in, in America. And this project, it covers 11 square miles of publicly owned uh, desert tortoise habitat. Now desert tortoises, as you can see, this is a desert tortoise, this very cute little reptile in the so corner. Cute in the top right of the screen. They're a critically endangered species of reptile native to the uh, Sonoran Desert and the Mojave Desert 
of Northwestern uh, Mexico and the, south, and the Southwestern United States. And they're equipped to live in a desert. Uh, they, their entire lives are built around uh, living in desert conditions. They are most active after seasonal rains um, and they have very low activity and they have a very low reproductive rate. Uh, they grow slowly. They have a very slow metabolism. Uh, to adjust to these kinds of conditions. They spend most of their days living in burrows and rock crevices in order to conserve energy and conserve the water in their bodies uh, in order to survive in very dry, arid conditions. And unfortunately, pretty disappointingly, um, the plan for this Gemini solar project was to actually capture these desert tortoises and keep them in a holding facility for up to two years during the period of construction and then release them into the facility grounds to, and I quote, see how they fare. Now, I just find this practice just, just, just to be inherently wrong on so many levels. Um, I think that and even scientists who are called to uh, kind of study these desert tortoises and see how they would fare, literally, uh, with the installation of the solar project, um, they found out that desert tortoises would, it would take a very long time uh, if they ever even would adapt to be able to adjust to these kinds of conditions that the solar panels were installed. Because when solar panels are installed in these kinds of areas, it's just changed. There's more shade. Um, there's, not, there's not as much space for tortoises to roam. Um, and also, not all tortoises would be able to be rescued. Think about that. I mean, they couldn't find every single desert tortoise in this process. Some would, prob would probably be forgotten or maybe even really hurt by these, the installation of these solar panels. So this is kind of, a, I'd say, a very, it's a complete invasion of their space. And that is, it's just not the right move to make in order to um, promote solar, the solar industry and solar panels. Instead, what I, what I advocate for is what's called agrivoltaic systems. It's kind of a, it's a play on words. It's a combination of agricultural systems and photovoltaic systems, which is the word described for uh, solar technology and solar panels. And this practice, it's basically where solar panels are mixed with uh, wildflowers, mixed with crops, with farmers that they can use. Um, it provides space for plants that need shade because solar panels can provide shade for plants that need that. Um, and it also uh, has spots for plants needing sun right next to the solar panels. And this can really help native pollinator species of animals in these open spaces where they so often are prevalent. Um, here in, uh, according to the United Nations, up to $577 billion um, in uh, annual global food production relies on insect pollination. And almost 25% of native bee species, now bees are extremely important pollinators here, um, they're at risk of extinction in the United States. Um, the monarch butterfly, another uh, very important pollinator species of butterfly here in, in uh, North America and also different parts of the world, um, our North American population of them dropped by 68% over the past two decades, um, mostly because scrublands and wetlands have converted to agriculture. And you can see the parallel between the conversion to agriculture and the conversion to solar panels, uh, solar fields, that although one might seem to be the more, the better, the better option, the more eco-conscious option. Um, the entire system needs to be taken into consideration. The entire system where, um, you know, all wildlife is included in this process, that they are heard, that they are seen, that they are, they are understood for needing their own habitat. And when solar panels and wildlife, uh, wildflower meadows um, and crops that are very beneficial to pollinators can all be combined together, then really great things can happen and, um, People can receive the solar energy that they need, and wildlife can also retain their natural and deserved uh, habitats for hopefully for as long as we can. Um, on this slide, I know we're running out of time, so I'm just going to briefly talk about um, biomimicry. Biomimicry is the, the practice of um, people mimicking uh, designs and production in nature that are extremely effective. Uh, so that we can use those designs in our in our own practices, uh, in our own communities, in technology, and so on. Um, as you can see on this page, um, you can see that in the bottom left corner, you can see that airplane wing uh, and the bird wing right next to each other. That's actually based on um, different 
airplanes that are being built now that are actually being shaped, uh, being built in the shape of a V, like the letter V. Now, um, you often, heard, maybe you've heard that uh, birds fly in a V formation in order to um, move forward more uh, effectively because with the flapping of each bird, um, uh, starting from the very, starting from the very front uh, of the formation, it gives uh, more momentum for the birds behind them to, to be able to flap. And uh, they're not going against any wind force. They're actually moving with the wind they create. And so they're actually constructing airplanes based on this design. So, um, and you can also see um, solar panels, uh, or sorry, solar panels, um, wind turbine blades, sorry, uh, in the middle there, um, next to the humpback whale, uh, that kind of whale species, that those turbine blades are being built uh, because of the efficiency of the way uh, that humpback whales move their flippers in the water. They have little ridges uh, along them, they're little bumps. And uh, these bumps help the humpback whales move more quickly and fluidly through the water. So um, even, in, even in our renewable energy practices and our efforts, we're seeing that um, wind turbine blades can do the same thing. They can move more efficiently and quickly by having these kind of bumps along their edges so that they can move more quickly through the air and therefore generate electricity at a faster pace than others that wouldn't have this kind of design. So I just find it biomimicry to be very beautiful in a way of honoring nature while also um, finding and in innovating in our own experience um, of building new technologies. All right, so here at the Flossie Family Farm, uh, our with our plans for renewable energy, um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take larger concepts and make them more small scale for our home. So in this process, we're identifying what needs we have for heating and cooling and electricity. And we're seeing how different practices can provide this for us. So for wind, for wind energy, what we're thinking is that we might have uh, a small uh, wind electric, electric system um, that's kind of small, built very small for a home. You can see in the picture, it wouldn't be a, a huge wind turbine, it would be this little tiny wind turbine. It's like a little windmill almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that picture is on a roof, but ours might be in a field or something. Yeah. yeah. And um, in the springtime, our property receives a lot of wind. So this wind turbine will be able to maybe give us a little bit of electricity. Um, we're thinking about we're thinking about maybe constructing a, what's called a little gazebo. It's a little it's a little uh, structure for um, for enjoying uh, for like recreation for uh, eating meals um, out in the field we have on the hill behind our house. And we're, I was thinking about maybe uh, putting up some lights in this gazebo. And I was thinking that maybe this little wind turbine could provide electricity for the lights in this gazebo, so that we could have a really fun time and also know that our electricity was coming from a sustainable source. Um, uh, a ground source heat pump system, I think, is really going to work for our house, our main home here. Um, I'm thinking that since a trench is going to need to be dug or possibly a well is going to need to be drilled for this to happen, um, I'm thinking that it might need to be uh, this process, it might need to be planned out behind our house on the hillside. Um, it's definitely a possibility or maybe along the, dr the driveway where our cars go. Um, we're, we've been realizing recently that we don't even really use our driveway with our cars quite as often as we did before. So this might be a really great place to maybe dig a little trench uh, for the pipe system of a ground source heat pump to go in order to efficiently heat and cool our house. So I think that that process could definitely work out in the near future, hopefully this year. Um, and for solar panels, I'm thinking that we might want to uh, have solar panels across our street where lots of our meadows are, where lots of our pollinator species um, live and pollinate various plant species. Um, I'm thinking that we could plant different different kinds of vegetables that appreciate sun, um, that even maybe would like creep up the solar panel, the, the structure of the solar panels a little bit like squash. Um, and yeah, I think that, um, I think that just uh, using the solar panels could really help us uh, have electricity for our home, um, maybe for other various structures. We also have a little uh, house down the road that we just purchased uh, in 2020. Um, piece original piece of the farm, yeah. And um, that house, that could be, uh, we're thinking about installing uh, a different kind of heat pump that I'll explain uh, in the next slide or so, called an air source heat pump. Uh, I'll explain about that on the next, on the next slide. 
And uh, yeah, so those are just the plans. And we're thinking that this year is going to be the year where we finally start to install these. Ooh. So we're very excited about that. Um, so our renewable energy on the farm is currently is uh, we've been implemented. <laughs> sorry, I'm a little distracted by the funny gift right there. It's just very funny um, um, with the tree and the tractor. Sorry, I'm uh, back to the point. Um, <laughs> um, so our renewable energy. Um, so far, what we've been able to do is we've been able to install an air source heat pump. Um, so an air source heat pump is just, it's similar to a ground source heat pump. It just uses outside air rather than the temperature of the ground in order to modify indoor air temperatures, which is why it's very common in places where there isn't much space for uh, for digging into the ground, like in urban areas where, I mean, you, you guys probably understand, like if you have air conditioners and if you live in a heavily crowded area, you you can see how the air conditioner doesn't take it might not take up too much space but the idea of digging a trench in any kind of space near you might it just might be too much because there's just too many people around you so that's why air source heat pumps are very common is, is because they're very similar to air conditioners um so that's what we have we installed that you can see me on our tractor here in this picture right here in the bottom uh back in 2020 we installed that in um our studio house uh, right next to our home and it, it's very efficient. We love the heating and cooling that that provides. And um, also, we, we decided to find out where our, our uh, current electricity comes from at the farm. And we found out that it actually comes from uh, hydropower electric plants at Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls are a series of uh, beautiful, very iconic waterfalls that are on the border of the United States and Canada. They're actually just uh, three hours west of us. And um, these uh, hydropower sites, these hydropower plants at the falls, They've produced electricity just for our home and for our surrounding area. So these are just some things to think about. Um, we're obviously thinking about maybe being off grid, so therefore not being connected to the electrical grid uh, in the near future. But for now, producing our own. yeah, producing our own. But for now, uh, it's at least good to know that while we're thinking about what to do, that our electricity that we currently have is being uh, sustainably sourced from a hydropower plant. That's at least good to know. It gives us uh, peace of mind. It gives us little bit of security. We feel like, oh, we can think. We don't have to worry too much. <laughs> so um, that's what we've been able to do. And um, I'm very excited about this year, what we can do further uh, in the coming months. And on my last slide here, this is just an example of um, different uh, different sites on our farm that can be, uh, they can be made more sustainable with renewable energies. I originally made this map as a way of thinking about how geothermal energy could be found and could be implemented on the farm. But I'm realizing now too that um, we can use any kind of sustainable technologies on any of these parts of the farm. Um, the carriage house you can see down in this corner, it has an air source heat pump. So it's, uh, it already has a renewable energy source to heat and cool its interior. Um, our current home here, it's, it's gonna be, uh, we're gonna install a ground source heat pump for it to heat and cool the inside, and we're very excited about that. Um, and in the field across the street, I just put down space for geothermal heating, not, not because we're actually gonna put geothermal, uh, a geothermal trench there, but because I'm just giving, giving an example of how open spaces can, be, can have any purpose. That space is most likely gonna be used for solar panels and wild, uh, wildflower meadows. But I'm just showing how no matter where you are, there's always a space uh, that can be used for any kind of idea that you have or ambition that you have of uh, improving the sustainability, the uh, efficiency for the environment and uh, also financially um, for for your property. So that's that map and um, I'm very excited about our plans. Yes, so, it really is exciting, yeah. isn't it? All right, now winding towards the end of our presentation here, now let's start talking about our car. Ooh. We have a really old car, which we named Greeny, green car. It's that green car you see there in the picture. <laughs> now, Greeny is uh, from 1999. He, we call him he, <laughs> <laughs> is uh, it's a Honda CRV. Just a little, little car that our parents bought a long time ago. And uh, our car, um, it's, it's been our family car for, for a very long time. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of history involved in this. And we're hoping to make this car into a greenhouse because we saw something really cool on social media 
where um, old school buses were turned into greenhouses. And we thought, well, wouldn't that be really cool to make our old car, green car, into a greenhouse? So these are just some, kind of some interesting ideas to regenerate. We've mm -hmm. had lots of happy memories in this car, uh, going to uh, going on family trips, and um, instead of putting green car in the junkyard, you know, mm -hmm. just rock away and pollute with oil and gas and all, why can't we make green car into a regenerative greenhouse using mm -hmm. the structure mm -hmm. and honoring the memory of this car? Mm -hmm. So here we got a really cool plan. Uh, I, I drew this plan um, for green car, some possible ideas, like maybe we could have some water tanks on top of the roof and uh, use old shower heads from, from the shower to um, to drain the water, to water the plants from the, the rain barrels on top, potentially make a, a little ladder on the side to, to climb up to the top of the roof and, uh, and tend to sun-loving plants on the top. Um, you know, it would be interesting to even convert the gas-powered uh, gas powered engine into an electric one, um, take out the majority of the car seats and leave the driver's seat so that the car could even be driven around our farm um, seasonally, mm -hmm. like drive the, the greenhouse car <laughs> close to the house during the cold winter months so it's, mm -hmm. it's easy to get to in the snow or even put the car further away in bright patches of sunlight during the summer months um, to tend to the plants. So that's just a really cool idea mm -hmm. that we have to regenerate and uh, even upcycle this old car that we have um, to create a sustainable energy system. Yeah, I really can't wait to see that. That'll be yeah. exciting. There we go. Another option is uh, is Sparky, our, our old 1931 Ford Model A truck. It's an old car from an old truck from 1931 that we really, really love. It's uh, Sparky is essential to the history of the farm. Um, we bought we bought Sparky as a as a way to learn about the engine and teach people about uh, historical vehicles on the farm. Um, and it's just been a, an absolute joy to learn about the engine and the systems of this truck. Um, and lots of patience because lots of patience. Sparky really runs. Mm -hmm. It's very old. Um, we're hoping to bring Sparky, who's a, uh, let's see, he's 90, uh, how old is he this year? Uh, he's 92, 92 this year. 92 yeah. year old truck. <laughs> um, to bring this 92 year old truck into the future um, by making the engine sustainable. Mm -hmm. We hope to implement really cool, um, really cool uh, systems into this truck here. I'll show you. There we go. There's our design. Possibly a wind turbine in the front, wind powered, solar powered, a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. We're not really too sure quite yet how to make Sparky sustainable. Bring this old historic truck that has lots of value into the future. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the the future of green technology. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the tires could pick up some kind of energy from the road. Uh, mm -hmm. The spinning of the wheels could generate its own its own power. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just a really cool experiment that we're trying to implement, um, and we're still learning. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just a really cool plan mm -hmm. uh, with Sparky, um, you know, to be sustainable. <laughs> so, um, lastly, you know, just something that I want to uh, to impart as we as we take in all that we learned today um, about sustainable renewable energy, um, I want to mention the honorable harvest which is an a set of indigenous principles um, of uh, exchanging a life for a life and uh, something to think about when we, uh, when we think about harvesting uh, energy or, or anything for that matter. Uh, these principles were, were brought to us by Robin Kimmerer. Um, she is a, she's an indigenous woman and uh, she, she tells us these principles. The first one is to listen. When we are about to harvest something, whether it's a, a vegetable or uh, some kind of a fruit, or even if we're going to interact with something, any part of nature or any part of, of um, any part of society, to listen, to interact with it, what does it say to us? You know, as we're about to harvest a tomato, does it speak to us? We ask it, can we harvest this? Maybe the answer is yes. Maybe the answer is no. Wait, wait, hold on. Okay. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> you know, and, and Robin tells us these, in these indigenous principles to go home with the answers no, because the time wasn't right. And this this thing, this vegetable, this tomato, this, this person that we're, we're interacting with told us no, and we need to honor that. The next principle is to never take the first 
and never take the last. That's something very interesting to think about, mm -hmm. that we're all part of this greater system. And it's not right to take the first, and it's certainly not right to take the last. So let's keep that in mind as we harvest renewable energy. We also take only what we need, really what we need. You know, sometimes that's that's something hard to, to comprehend because, you know, um, sometimes wants and needs are, are kind of interchangeable in, in our, our modern society. But um, we only take what we need, and that is a very sustainable way to go about our lives. And also to leave the rest. So we take what we need, and then the rest we leave for others to enjoy, because we are part of a greater whole and a greater web of life. We always remember to use everything that we take. Use it all, value it, and use it for a long period of time. You know, um, things are meant to last. You know, we, we value, we, we appreciate our relationships with people. I kind of, I see it as, um, you know, to, to use what's given to us in that way. You know, that we're going to honor our friends and our families and our relationships. Um, to to appreciate that which we're given, and that which we take, we take love, mm -hmm. we take appreciation, you know, and um, we also share what we take. We share it through hug and appreciation, you know. We reciprocate the gift of that which we're given. <laughs> we be grateful for what we have. That's a very very important one. I want to take a moment to breathe in and breathe out. There's so much to be grateful for, everything, even sometimes when it seems like we don't have very much. And sometimes I, I get lost in that, in that, that, you know, world of negativity. But I have to realize that I have so much, and I really, really am grateful for all that I'm given. <laughs> now, this is the last principle here that I want to, uh, to impart, um, thanks to Robin, <laughs> is uh, she mentions that this is, this is a very old indigenous practice that isn't directly connected with the principles that I just spoke about, but is a, it's a difficult one. Take only what's given freely. This is hard for us to comprehend. What is given to us freely? Well, the energy from the sun and the wind is certainly, certainly given in much abundance. So we harness it. We, we, we appreciate the energy from the sun. You know, we can take as much energy from the sun. We can take as much energy from the wind and create sustainable, renewable power. Thank you, everyone. Wow. wow what that, a, was that, was, that was a really cool yeah. presentation. Thank you so much, everyone. Well, thank you. We, we had a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah we did. We really did. Yeah. <laughs> From the memes to the funny gifts. Uh, that, was, yeah. that was amazing. Trying to find the memes that could match with each topic was a challenge, but yes. we did very well with that. It was. Yeah. Yes. And you stayed up too late. Yeah, here. we did. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Zoya Zach. Very wonderful uh, presentation. They are described the details about the sustainable development goals number seven. I'm very feel proud. I'm very feel happy because this is my first time to see the original presentation or the arts, manual arts with the virtual arts because it's not common. Very congratulations, Thank you. Zoya Zach. Now, uh, before to, to finish this webinar, I want to take the picture with the participants in this moment to connect now in the Zoom. So I said in this moment, the Padlet like, what is the objective for the second activity? The second activity asks to two questions about the point, the Sutoya Roman goals six and seven. And these two questions stay in the Padlet link and you can, you can check it in, in the link uh, uh, and the line two for the philosophy family farm. So the participants when surprised in the Google form of this webinar can get the certificate official, the official certificate of these uh, webinars. So in this moment, I take the picture. Please, uh, if you put the the Zoom background, no problem. I said in, in this moment, uh, the Zoom background. Please, everyone, can you put the camera? Because it's official uh, activity. 
Beatrice, Stephanie, Lucia, Lupita, Heidi, please put the camera. Okay, the people can connect the YouTube Live, no problem, because we are sent the, the register official, the, the verification of, of the, the attendance of this webinar, no problem. Uh, Stephanie, Lucia, Heidi, can you put the camera? Gabriel, thank you so much for staying in this webinar. Welcome. <laughs> okay. Right? Okay, if not put the camera, okay. One, two, three, I, I count the uh, one, two, three, the, the picture, okay? Let me to, okay. We are ready? We are ready now? Okay, Lucia, uh, you can, as the the la villenta eh, selecciona donde está la cámara y entonces selecciona donde dice escoger eh, fondo virtual el zoom sin problemas y no puedes no te preocupes ya para una próxima pues te coloca el fondo eh, I speak Spanish in this moment no <laughs> but no problem okay we are ready are you ready now Take the picture. Okay. No, not ready. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Count for one, two, three. Okay. One, two, two, three, everyone. Smile, everyone. Smile. Ah, okay, Lupita. I take it again, picture. No problem. Again. Again, hey, Haley, can you put the camera? No problem. Okay, count the three. One, two, three. Smile, everyone, smile. Thank you so much. Uh, don't forget, ask the Padlet, but I can send the Padlet link and you can put the opinions of these two questions. This is the second part of this activity. Thank you so much, Zach and Zoe for explaining about the data, about the, the opinions for the farm with the relationship of sustainable development goals. No, before to finish this webinar, it's very important. Explain about the relationship of the air charter with the sustainable development goals. The importance for the relationship of these sustainable development goals, the air charter put the practice the sustainable development of education. It's very fundamental, the former in the high school, in the universities, uh, and you and you job too. Thank you again, everyone, for staying here in this webinar. So, well, I say official, I finish this webinar, uh, the webinar far in action of 2030 children and youth. Thank you so much, everyone. See you soon in the next webinar. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Saga, so you can stay here, please. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. We'll, we'll Thank, you. Thank you very bye -bye. much. Thank you. Bye bye. See you soon. Bye bye. Hi. Hi, everyone. Okay. Uh, what is Jose? Uh, Zoe, can you cancel the. Oh, what do you need me to do? You are the host? No, I am host. Can you cancel the... Uh, are we... How do we do that? Wait, are we, wait, are we host? Is it what happened? Um, no, the, the, custom the custom live streaming service, click stop stream yard. Uh, Here. Oh, 